Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Friday fireside chat. Um, pretty soon, I'll be able to actually light the fire, which will be fun. Um, my guest uh, this week is Eric Johnson, who is a dear friend, um, longtime colleague at Columbia Business School, and for our purposes, author of this terrific new book called The Elements of Choice. Um, and what I particularly like about this book is, first of all, it's just it's fun to read, you know, it's full of just stories and anecdotes and things that make you go, well, well that's weird. Um, but also makes a very serious point, which is that we often uh, operate under the illusion that we're exercising our free will and making choices. And in, in reality, that's often uh, not the case. So Eric, welcome. Thank you. So delighted to be here. Oh, it's a real pleasure. So let's start with um, where the book came from, because I know this is a longstanding passion of yours. Um, what made it crystallize into a book? Um, a very good question, and one that took me a long time to actually say, I should write a book about that. And I've been doing research in this area for 30 years, including 20 years where it didn't have the name Choice Architecture. And you know, uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein wrote a book called Nudge, and came out in 2018, 20, 2008. And I said, I actually wrote a review for that book for Science Magazine. And I said, this is one and a half great books. The first one is essentially the idea of that we should pose decisions to people in a way that's in their best interest. That's the, they wrote that book brilliantly. They wrote half of a second brilliant book, which is how do you do that? That is, what's the best way to pose questions to people so they make the decision that's in, in their best interest? Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of it, it's not their fault. The size wasn't that advanced then. We had lots of bits and pieces. There really wasn't a vocabulary, even the, we didn't have a set of tools that would be in the toolbox. And so eventually I realized, and it took me a long time to get to it, about four years, that we could organize those tools and to find good examples and good stories and principles that I hope would fold, pull together to mm -hmm. show people how to do choice architecture. Mm -hmm. And I, as all of us, if you want to actually learn how to do something, you teach it. So I started doing a course at Columbia on choice architecture. The students taught me a lot. And we had worked together, and had some great times coming up with examples. And so the answer is, this, that's how this book came to be written. I love it, I love it. Um, so one of the things that is, I think, very, useful about the book, I'll call it useful, is you have some very specific elements that make up what you call a choice architecture. And before you go there, um, I think the the concept of a choice architecture is something I think a lot of people don't really think about, you know, that like we, we sort of blunder our way through our days, not very consciously responding to the stimuli in the environment, but the fact that every single decision we have to make, you know, from the very modest to the earth shattering. Um, somebody had to, to, to frame that decision. Somebody had to bring us to the point where a choice had to be made. And hence the concept of choice architecture, which is what are the elements that go into our kind of brains when we're making these choices. And so you start off with um, um, the notion of, of plausible paths. I think that's one of the first things you talk about. Exactly. So one of the things that let's to illustrate to our imagine you're facing a website and you're deciding what to, how to give people a choice. There are a bunch of decisions you're making as a choice architect. So not only do we not realize that the choice architect affects us, often the choice architect, or I'll just say designer, because that's an easier phrase, the designer doesn't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So you could actually start with a list of things the designer has to decide. And that's sort of how the book gets structured. Now, what you then need are some principles. So let's take one very simple thing, like is how many options do you present someone? You know, that's a choice you make. Mm -hmm. And then the designer makes that choice and it's gonna affect you. As, as the chooser, the person making the choice, too many things you're gonna give up, too few things you'll miss out on something good. So there's actually a design decision that's made by the, the designer. Now, the chooser has to decide how to make a choice, and they do it usually in a way that's very easy for them, not being very sensitive to actually what the impact is on choice quality. So my very one example I, I love from the book 
is a friend of mine who was a, who's a medical informaticist. These are the people who designed the electronic health records. So if you go to the doctor these days, your doctor spends some time looking at you, but he's spending a lot of time, or she's spending a lot of time, typing on a screen and entering in. So somewhere in that decision, they're actually making a choice about what drugs to prescribe. And, you know, it turns out in this particular hospital, about 90% of the drugs were actually non-generics, or I'm sorry, 40% were non-generics. And that's expensive because the generic drugs are a fifth of the cost. So it turns out I'm past allergy season now, but I take something called an, Alle an Allegra. And that costs, if you use the brand name, a dollar a pill. If you use the generic, which, by the way, has the simple name fexafenidine hydrochloride, <laughs> it's 20 cents a pill. Now, I had to rehearse to get the fexafenidine hydrochloride to roll off my tongue like that. But the poor doctor doesn't remember the name of the generic and so types Allegra. And so that's avoiding an effort for a decision to go to the physician's deck reference or Google and what's the name for that. What my friend did, and this is a very nice published paper, is they just said if you started typing Allegra, A-L-L, -L, it would auto-populate it with fexafenidine hydrochloride. Mm. And doctors, oh good, that's the generic. I wish I remembered that. About 90% of them keep the generic and actually that saves doctor's time, it saves the hospital money, but actually more importantly, it saves people because what it does is it means they have drugs they can afford and they tend to comply with those drugs. Mm -hmm. So it actually, they take the drug daily instead of you know cutting it down to every other day because that's what they can afford to take. Mm -hmm. So a very small change in the chart structure operates through the plausible path of making it easy to do the right thing. And there's lots of other examples, but that illustrates, I think, the importance of a plausible path in designing how we make choices. Yeah. Where did that idea come from to put in the name of the generic as a default? I and mean, was that just happenstance or was were they actually studying why, what the root causes of why doctors weren't prescribing? They, they were trying to design a system that would increase the prescription of generics. And I think increasingly people who do electronic health records have become sensitive to this. Um, there are other cases, for example, defaults for the uh, kinds of opioids that get prescribed. Mm -hmm. It turns out there are very clear recommendations. You shouldn't prescribe uh, more than three days of opioids of a certain dosage to people. Mm -hmm. Yet that was not easy for doctors to do. So other doctors, this is at Penn, actually started, uh, actually medical informaticists changed the default to be the right prescription. And it became much more frequently so I think the, the notion of getting people to do the right thing by making it easy is mm -hmm. starting to permeate even when those people are doctors and even when the right thing might be prescribing the right drug for someone so they are less likely to become addicted to opioids. Yeah, and what I like about the, um, the, the, the way you structured the book also is that, um, you know, we have this, this, I think, I mean, we get trained with this in elementary school or something, but we have this sort of model in our minds of economic person, right? <laughs> economic man wow. um, that makes all these decisions on uh, sort of benefit maximizing things. But when you when you explore how choices actually get made, so much of it is about what's the shortest path I have to travel to get to a decision, right? What's the least burdensome on my cognitive functioning that I can have? Uh, what indeed are the defaults? How much effort does it take? And and you know, when you consider all the choices we make in the course of a day, like there's only so much energy to go around. And so it doesn't, it's not surprising when you think about it that way, but when you look at how these designs are created, a lot of times we're not thinking about that. Yeah, and many, I mean, let's face it, you, here, here's my favorite example of, of that. You go to a website and have, you have just landed in Europe a couple of weeks ago. Every website I go to, I get popped up this screen saying, do you want to manage your cookies? And my answer is, no, I want to order food. Right. And so even though there's a long-term consequence of not clicking that button and not auto-managing my cookies, there's actually a goal, short-term goal I have in mind, which is to, or, is to order food or groceries or get a flight. And so therefore, people tend, okay, I'll accept whatever it is that's the default. Mm -hmm. Well, and you had a very interesting experience in an NPR interview, right, where you were walking through with a, an interviewer what it would actually take to set privacy settings the way that you wanted them set up? 
So it's actually a, a, a fun story because the re reporter came in, had the recorder running, and he simply wanted to tell Verizon not to sell his phone records to companies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the phone company not only wanted him to say his name, give his address twice, but also tell them his phone number. Now, if anybody knows your phone number, I think it was Verizon. It should so be the it's phone actually company. Kind of, right? Yeah, it should be the phone company, but not once, but twice, just to make sure they had it right. Now, clearly, the, the, there is actually now a, a name for this. It's sometimes called sludge, mm -hmm. where you make it hard for people to pick the thing that they want. Mm -hmm. um, and in computer science, they actually have a name for this called dark patterns, which sounds very threatening. But essentially, it says you can use choice architecture to keep people doing what it is they would want to do. Right, right. Well, and you use the example of subscriptions, right? Where yeah, so that's out of the computer science it's called it asymmetry. And my favorite name in the literature is for making it so hard to get out of a subscription that you never do. They actually call it, they, they, they make the analogy to the Roach Motel, which those of us who are old enough remember this being a wonderful commercial and the roaches check in and they don't care well at the customer hotel they check in they never check out they still have that subscription to spotify or to whatever that they've forgotten about and it's just too much trouble to oh, opt yeah. out of yeah well, i mean i had this with our friends at microsoft and without boring you with a long story getting the thing set up was a snap getting it unset up required right. literally weeks of work i mean it was just a nightmare yeah. Um, I eventually had to cancel the credit card that it was auto billed to, to make it stop. I mean, that's yeah. extreme, right? <laughs> yeah. And again, economic rationality wouldn't suggest, you know, you're paying $10 a month. It will spend 10 minutes to get rid of this. No, people don't. No, they don't. They don't. Um, this is fascinating. So we've got, um, we've got the notion of plausible paths. Maybe just walk down the sort of elements of the choice. Because mm -hmm. I think people might find that really interesting. So, so a, yeah, a friend of mine sort of sparked this by saying, imagine you're designing a website. What are the things you'd have to decide? And one of the things, some of them are pretty obvious. Um, it may be less obvious they'll impact your choice, but one is obviously we've talked about the number of options, right? Should it be three? Should it be a hundred? Or as the New York school city, the New York school system gives its kids in city schools 769 different high schools to pick a train. I think that might be too many. There's reasons they do that, but that might be not the best number. Um, another option is what are the number of attributes you give? So for every alternative, this could be a price, if it's food, there be attributes like the calorie count, the nutrition, how, you know, sort of what it's made from. You have to decide what attributes to present. And even then, when you think about this, if you might like a matrix, this can be what you put inside the matrix and how you put it in. So you can describe an attribute by thumbs up, thumbs down. You describe an attribute by, you know, 3.6 milliliters per gram. You know, and that's going to affect how people choice. Notice the 3.6 milliliters per gram actually makes it hard to process. And that information is much less likely to be used than if it's simple, like the number of stars or even a letter grade, A, B, C, D. Um, so I think those are just, that's just some of the highlights. Uh, one other thing that I think people don't realize has a big effect is the order. What's mm -hmm. first, what's last. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's obviously something. So these are all, you're making the decision. So when someone comes up to you and says, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? And they start giving you options. If they have, have, if they're a clever choice architect designer, they have a lot of decisions to make and probably a lot of control over what you're going to choose, where you're going to go for dinner. So, so you know, how easy is it to exercise choice, ordering, and so forth? Um, you also talk about um, accessibility and inhibition, mm -hmm. and you give the example of the famous landing on the Hudson. And what yes. Captain Fellerberger had to do to really hone in on how he was going to manage this incredibly fraught situation. Uh, just for those that may not be familiar with the story, if there's anybody who isn't, it's um, the, there was a plane taking off from, I guess, from LaGuardia, and a flock of geese flew into its engines, and basically the plane stalled out. There was no power. Um, and Sullenberger had to make a decision as to what he was going to do next. And there really wasn't a playbook for this. 
No, in fact, the, ch the checklist that they're supposed to follow assumes you lose engine power at 20,000 feet. And he was in, you know, the low thousands. Um, and, you know, this is a tough decision in any case. And he had lots of options. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie that's based on this, um, you know, he gets called to task. Did he make the right choice? Because he, maybe he should have gone back to LaGuardia or flown over to New Jersey to Teterboro. So he has these options. Um, it turns out the one thing that's nice is I argue that lots of people don't think about how you do present choices to people. Well, one place that's not true, one place they work at this intensely is actually aircraft cockpit design. They actually sit you in a simulator and see if we put the button here, can you reach it? If we put the gauge here, will you look at it? And it turns out they developed a gauge that essentially made it very easy for him to do the one thing he had to do, which is get the plane at the right angle, the nose at the right angle, so the plane would fly as far as possible. And mm -hmm. that freed him up because then he could think about things. This is sort of the idea that memory is really important for decision making. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I've been to the Intrepid Museum. If you've been to New York there, the Intrepid Museum is this aircraft carrier that's in the mid 40s. And as a pilot, not surprisingly, he went had gone there. You can get see the space shuttle there. It's a it's a wonderful thing if you're into that set of thing. And he said, you know, I noticed there were lots of tugboats there and ferries. And in fact, the police have their essentially entire marine facilities right there. And you know, that let him think, you know, it's 42 degrees outside, it's 90 degrees outside, the water temperature was 42 degrees. I got to get these people rescued if I do a water landing very quickly. I'm going to put the plane down there. So the gauge being right gave him the ability to think about this past experience and put the plane in probably the one place he could on the Hudson that would ensure everyone was off that boat in a very short period of time. So and it's, the, it's the interplay be between memory and the plausible path of looking at this gauge. And he was, um, he talked about um, uh, shedding, shedding the load, right? Like, yeah. like, yeah, so the big, the big thing. concept was load shedding that basically, because the gauge was designed, he had the time to think about these things. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he could have done other things, but, you know, because he could look at the gauge, and basically easily decide what the right angle was, he could actually think. And there's a great comparison, which I, I don't have in the book, of a flight that would, had similarly lost power at 20,000 feet. But the gauge turns out it requires auxiliary power. Because when the engines stop, the generators go offline. Oh, wow. In Sullenberger's case, he went click and turn on the auxiliary generator. In the other case, not so much. And it turns out they ended up landing in the, uh, what sounded like a great spot, an abandoned airfield. The problem is the airfield had turned into a race course. So luckily, they missed all the cars going around the track. But that's a case of having the right technology to help you make the decision, and perhaps the wrong technology. Yeah, well, one of the things that's a big debate right now um, in automobile design is, you know, are we better off with buttons and sort of fixed uh, controls? Or are we better off with digital controls where you're making a choice on a digital panel? And there was just a study done by one of the big car companies. And it turns out that the buttons and levers are actually better because you, know, you have more muscle memory. They stay the same, like with digital controls, mm -hmm. choices move around the panel. And so you don't mm -hmm. have that automatic muscle memory. And I just, I, I, I would be interested if, if you've gotten any inquiries to sort of use this theory of choice architecture to help us design these everyday objects that, you know, could literally be life-saving or life-threatening. Not surprising. I've, I've gotten many more inquiries from people. How do we design the website to sell the car? <laughs> and fewer about how do we design the car? I mean, I think part of that is they use some of the technology we have from airplane design, but probably not enough of it. Mm -hmm. Notice how important it is to do experimentation to get that right. And it sounds like in the examples you're talking about, that's exactly what's going on. They're doing A-B testing to say, what's the best choice architecture? Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the advantages of having cars now with incredibly sophisticated telemetry is they can actually look at records, as you know, when there's an accident and see what was involved. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, Juan Miguel would like to know um, how many companies truly understand the effects that choice architecture has on their customers? It's a great question and it's gonna vary. Um, you know, some tech companies, which are actually all about their interface, an example that I use often is Netflix, mm -hmm. is all about. They're running hundreds of studies a month about what the right thing to do is. Mm -hmm. Other companies, like a car company that we did some work for um, a few years ago, had no clue. Even though it was this was a German company, uh, I call them Glam, German large auto manufacturer, which tells you the kind of car they make. And actually, I'm looking at uh, one of their competitors' logos outside my window in Berlin. Um, <laughs> essentially, they had no clue. What they had done, just to give you an example, and this is another tool we haven't talked about, is our defaults, the things that get pre-checked. Mm -hmm. Turns out in this car company, they had pre-checked all the cheapest options. Oh. And you ask them why, and they said, you know, some engineer or computer scientist or a guy who just does web pages designed that. And it was pretty easy to show that it was costing them a lot of money. And from the customer's perspective, what's really important to realize is not everybody wants the smallest, cheapest engine. If you've driven at all in Germany on the Autobahn, this is now a controversy. You do not want to have the smallest, cheapest engine. Um, you know, because the other folks on the, on the road don't. Mm -hmm. And oh, so right. it actually was worse off for the, comp for the company. <laughs> they told us later it was about uh, between four and five thousand dollars euro difference to change the defaults mm -hmm. and obviously worse for the customers because they ended up with cars they didn't want. Mm -hmm. Some people uncheck the default, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, you have to know to do that, right? Um, right. And, and so we've got a question uh, from Ulrich about um, health insurance. And I know you spend a big chunk of the book going through, uh, for example, the Obamacare sign-up options yes. and the various choices and how they're presented. And, I mean, these are very fraught choices, and it's very easy to make mistakes. You know, you're paying too much for coverage you don't need, or you're not getting the coverage you need, even if you could afford it. Yeah, there, there's a, a very nice study that looks at a company that thought giving people lots of choice was useful. So they gave them lots of policies. And it turns out by doing that, they gave them lots of policies that were bad. They were policies by bad, let me say specifically, they gave you the same coverage, but cost more than other policies. Wow. Right? They're the things you shouldn't buy if you did any kind of math whatsoever. Um, it turns out that about 40% of the of the people who worked for this company made choices that were bad in this sense. And in fact, they were more likely to be, by the way, the people who are lower salaried, mm -hmm. the people who are less sophisticated mathematically. Mm -hmm. It's tough. And you know, we've done a large set of studies actually looking, as you say, at the, the, the Obamacare site. And people can't do that. A lot of them do it at chance because they don't know how to combine these funny phrases like deductibles with other phrases, you know, other costs. And, you know, doing the math for them helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and in the book, and, and Davia Tamman is bringing this up, which is you, you talk about choice architecture that's designed to deceive, that's designed to um, not present information in a transparent and open way. And she mentioned specifically the decisions around the Boeing 737 MAX which you know was a disaster on many many fronts um but the way that they were positioning it right was oh no you don't need extra training oh no you don't need to you know be recertified oh no it's all fine um and and very deliberate choice architectures to not tell the truth another famous example is the uh, volkswagen uh, diesel scandal where they were committing fraud <laughs> and then the choice architecture around it i guess was to try to help it avoid being discovered Right. No, that, that's right. And obviously people can get try and get around regulation and sometimes just what's in their customer's best interests. Mm -hmm. And so there is a dark side. Um, I'll tell you a story that's not in the book, and it's uh, I should be very careful because we're just about to submit this paper. But a former presidential candidate, I'll, I'll let you guess who it might be, um, changed their website eight weeks before the election to say, your gift is a weekly gift. That box was pre-checked. 
-hmm. And I think lots of people didn't see it. So we're looking at the data. It turns out that data is part of the public record because the Federal Election Commission actually reports it. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that weekly gifts went way up when that happened. And somehow I think in the paper, I think will show convincingly, that's not because everyone decided to become a weekly donor. It's because it came what we're going to call in this paper a dark default. Mm -hmm. And it raised about $40 million for that campaign. Wow. Wow. Um, and, and if I memory serves me, it created quite a bit of public controversy too. Yes, afterwards. And what's, what I like about our research is people have said, look, lots of people are upset. We've actually figured out how much money that involved. And it turns out it was nice because there are a bunch of campa similar campaigns didn't do it. So they ran this nice experiment for us. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Um, so one other thing that you talk about, and in the book, you've got some interesting tables, which frame the topic in a way I hadn't really thought about before, which, and you talk about your two uncles um, yes. and their choice of when they should take social security. Right. Um, and, and you actually frame it in terms of, well, given this likelihood, that choice was the right choice, but this other choice would have been a mistake. And I think we don't, at least in my experience, we don't take enough time to really step back and look at decisions and say, well, given the context, was this a correct choice or was it actually a mistake? That's right. I mean, it's really hard to know because, you know, the standard phrase is, you know, preferences are yours. You don't need to actually judge someone else's preferences. Sometimes, though, like when we talked about health insurance, you could make identify policies just being bad ideas. You literally might as well take that money and put a match to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the case of Social Security, it's interesting because many people end up making a mistake, which is when they turn 62, they claim. Now, not everybody, you know, my favorite example is somebody who is not going to live a long time. Sorry to be a little bit of a buzzkill here, but <laughs> as someone who, you know, doesn't have much other money saved, they should claim Social Security early. But, you know, my other uncle, who actually had saved lots of money, every year he didn't claim Social Security, he would get 8% higher benefits. And remember, it's important now, particularly, that's inflation protected. It mm -hmm. actually will go up with the cost of living. So if he was making any, if he had any money, he should be using that instead of claiming Social Security, because what he has is basically. Now, of course, there is an issue that many people worry about, and they should, which is, of course, you know, solvency. But in the time frame my uncles were talking about, that wasn't going to happen. You know, the question was basically who was going to get the most money. And for one uncle, he should definitely wait. The other uncle, he'd claim early. So we know who's making a mistake. But the point for choice architecture is how do you help them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so a suggestion would be basically help them figure out what the best policy is or default them into that. Mm -hmm. So let me go back just to one example of the car company. It turns out what they did is they didn't do any fancy AI system. They said, basically, are you looking for a sports car or a family car? And they changed the defaults to be the appropriate default for each of those. So you can customize choice architecture, which I think is a really important lesson I hope people walk away with. Well, and in the book, you've talked about um, static versus dynamic choice architectures. And I think you used yes. an example talking about that, which is right. you can actually, to some extent, give users the ability to create their own pathways, to create their own choices. Yeah, um, and the phrase I, I, I like, I borrowed is choice engine. Because mm -hmm. when you're talking about a piece of paper, things are going to be pretty much the, the same. But even a good salesperson is a choice engine in the sense they can customize things. They say, oh, this is the kind of person who would like that car. Now, websites, of course, are, could be very good at that. You know, and Netflix has a very clear goal, which is to find you something to watch. Now, Netflix has a little bit of a different goal, too, which is to find you something that you will watch that's not expensive for them to produce. Well, this is one of the most intriguing things to me about Netflix, which is that like, I think I, I, like most people, would assume that Netflix is all about serving me up whatever I would find most delicious, right? And that's not actually true. <laughs> you that's know? right. 
<laughs> I mean, they'll give it to me kind of grudgingly if it's really expensive for them. But if I could consume, I don't know, 18 hours of Real Housewives or whatever the thing is that's not expensive for them, uh, they'd much prefer that, which I think is a very interesting line to walk because you're not dissatisfying your users necessarily, but you're also not giving them exactly what they think they're probably getting from you. Well, the other way of making a point for Netflix is that actually it would cost them all, it would cost them a lot of money and they'd have to charge you a lot more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the episodes of the, of the crown cost 10 million a piece and that would get to be a very expensive subscription mm -hmm. if that's all they, all they produced. So substituting in the example I, I, I love is substituting in a Downton Abbey, <laughs> you know, basically satisfies that need for, for watching the Royals. <laughs> uh, or or upper class British people at least <laughs> at a lot lower cost for them and probably ultimately for me as as, as a subscriber. Uh -huh. And if you could sneak in a few episodes of Upstairs Downstairs, even better. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's old. That's really cheap. Really old. Really inexpensive. <laughs> That's great. So um, part of the choice engine idea, uh, you use the example of Robinhood, the yes. investing app, um, as as having done some kind of interesting. Um, ways of getting people to behave with respect to investing. I mean, this is not, you know, what, what's what's the old line? Um, I earn money the old fashioned way, you know, I work for it, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and Robinhood gamifies everything. So Robinhood is a fascinating example. And, you know, I, one of the things I teach at Columbia is consumer finance with a economist named Steve Zeldis. And what's really interesting about that is people tend to lose the fact that investors are human, particularly retail investors. And the thing that Robinhood was doing, which is very good to get people involved, is they would do things like give them a share of stock when they did their first trade. Wonderful. One problem is, of course, the people who buy the, that product, i.e. sign up for Robinhood, are gambling. Right, because it would be a lottery. You might get Microsoft, you might get J&J, &J, you might get someone you never heard of. And so they're basically getting customers who are initially risk seeking, which I think is really an interesting consequence of the choice of architecture. But then, of course, every time you trade it, you saw confetti. Now, our colleagues in finance would tell you pretty quickly, it's not a good strategy to do a lot of trading if you want to build wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, unless you have inside information, not literally inside information, but unless you know the industry better than most people, it's better to buy and hold. And what they were doing is actually increasing people's buying and selling, which it turns out was really how they made their money. Mm -hmm. You know, their money was made by essentially payment orders, you know, not the, the actual cost to the customer was hidden, right? I, there were free trades, well, free in a way, but not really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Robinhood is a good example of someone who did a choice engine. We're talking about too many ne negative examples in some sense, but who used the choice engine to actually build a customer base quickly and actually in a way that for them it was quite profitable. But probably what everyone who looks at traders who use Robinhood say, less well than people use other, other brokers. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the other things you use as an illustration is when you when you're evaluating things right so you use the example of a woman who routinely gives her uber driver a three because that's nothing exceptional but she doesn't know that 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 could have tremendous negative consequences for the driver that's right so this goes to uh, one of the choices that we make as designers is what scale to use mm -hmm. um and you know that can be as i said anything from some obscure numeric fact that only engineers would understand to basically a thumbs up, thumbs down. And one of the things that often is the case of when I, by the way, I'm not a bad grader, but I'm not the easiest grader at Columbia Business School. But, you know, it's clear I was giving a, an Uber driver a four. It turns out if I did that too often, they would lose their ability to drive for Uber mm -hmm. because it turns out the average grade in Uber was 4.8. And they actually cut off people who have too low ratings. So the decision about what scale to use turns out to have consequences. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's important. 
Yeah. Well, and I see it a lot in uh, survey design. So mm -hmm. I had my car repaired recently and, and the technician who was lovely and, you know, went above and beyond and did all the right things. But he looked at me and he said, look, if I get anything other than the top grade, like in every category, mm -hmm. um, it's really going to be bad for me. So he was trying to make sure I was aware of what the scale was that he was being evaluated on. And I thought, wow, that's, that's harsh, right? It is. And, and my understanding is often that's part of the compensation the service tech will get mm -hmm. is based on the average grade. So he's he, he's not just wants to look good. You know, it's part of his livelihood. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to come back to our chat people in just one second. But I guess a question that I have been wrestling with is how can you tell ex ante? whether a decision is a high quality decision or not because you know one of the things that's very frustrating and you know i work in strategy so um you know you never know <laughs> you could be setting up a travel business in october of 2019 and everything could be great but now we have a global pandemic and you're still getting to a bad outcome and you could also just blunder along and wind your Find, find yourself in the right space. And so it's very frustrating because you know you, you can't run controlled experiments in real life. And so you right. never know whether it was the process that was at fault or whether it was just dumb luck. Well, since I tend to study consumer decisions, I my life is a lot easier. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's a lot easier because I can look across lots of consumers and I can often quantify what the entries are, particularly with financial products. Mm -hmm. right? I can see, did they buy the product that's most cost effective? Um, and so there's a little bit less uncertainty in those decisions. Um, one way actually of studying decisions just is something dominated like the insurance policies. Does, is it essentially the same product, but at a worse price? Mm -hmm. That's quite easy. The problem in real life is you end up then using more complicated situations where it's not as obvious. And I don't have an easy solution, Rita, to your problem, or I would be a, fav a famous st strategy professor. Um, it's a really tough problem, but you can at least make sure the mechanism that's used to make the decision seems sensible. And then, of course, as you know, if you categorize enough decisions, you look at enough of them, you start using the world's statistics to try and figure out what was right mm -hmm. and what was wrong. But it's, it's very difficult for some decisions. Absolutely. Oh, it really is. And I think this is where um, just when I think about how executives are developed and grown, right? Um, it takes a lot of doing of decision-making before you begin to develop that sense for when when is it likely to be a sounder decision than others. So, um, so Jay, I think her name is, or his or her name, is asking, uh, so, okay, I've, I've come to you as a student. I want to be a better decision architect. Um, what, what advice would you give us? The first one is pretty obvious, which is realize the power that you have as a designer. And I think that's something that there, there have been increasing number of studies that actually look do people set the right defaults to people. And the answer is they don't. Or And so obviously just even realizing that's the case is, is important. Mm -hmm. A second is if, if it's obvious if you take your customer's perspective, what is the right option? Try and help then find that right option. And that might involve different kinds of people getting different kinds of web pages, customizing them. Um, but when you don't know, ultimately, I think the question is experiment. Actually, particularly on the web or on your phone, these things can be done, A-B testing. It's not just something that Netflix can do. You can actually say, if we put this first, does it actually get an increased market share? Mm -hmm. And so just a large part of this is to think of your decision environment as a cockpit. You know, mm -hmm. can I actually figure out how to design it so that people end up being satisfied customers? Mm -hmm. So that, those would be the kinds of things I would, I would, I would talk as at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess one of the sort of things people are really curious about are, where does trust come in? You know, because to me, like, I think part of the dilemma that we have with these choice architectures is, in many cases, we are trusting the designer to have our best interests, you know, before them, and oftentimes that's not uh, the case. So one one thing that comes to my mind is um, when you think about medical decisions and, you know. Healthcare is such a fruitful area for study because it's so screwed up in so many ways. And there was just a report the other day of 
people with non-life-threatening conditions going either to an emergency room or going to, say, an urgent care center. And obviously the cost differential is mm-hmm. massive between the two. But that choice is not always clear to people, even if even if it's theirs to choose. I mean, sometimes it's made for them by default, but even if it's theirs to choose. And you talk a lot about medical decisions in one part of the book in which you unfortunately had a long stay in a hospital. Um, yeah. And we're looking at people making the choice of whether to donate an organ or not, or whether to um, you know give up a kidney, even if they were alive, those kinds of choices. Um, and I, I'm just wondering where trust fits into that whole equation. Well, we all hope we trust our doctors because the world is very complicated. I mean, we can't be full-time experts in everything, so we trust our doctors. And I think most of the time that's, you know, hopefully for most people, a very good outcome. It's a very important. It's no less the case, though, that you should, you should probably have the same kind of trust for other individuals in your life that are choice architects. And we don't. And one of the challenges is, I think you make a really good point that I haven't thought about, which is I realize I'm not a very good decision maker when it comes to my health. Mm. You know, so when the doctor says you should take this drug or you should have this procedure, you say, okay, or you may ask a second doctor. Um, But for so many decisions, like financial decisions, people don't get help. And it's, that's a place where I think, the incentives for many financial professionals may not be aligned with the customer. Yet somehow we all think we're really good at making our financial decisions, or at least good enough to avoid them, mm-hmm. at least until things go wrong. Right. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, th- I think that's, a, that's a, a lovely contrast. And so in medicine, you know, trust is part of what we, and expertise is what we need in financial decision making it's what what we desperately need and don't have Mm. in many cases well and another another whole area where this comes into play i would argue is with legal disputes right that um many we just know that a lot of people who could really benefit from solid legal advice can't afford it can't access it don't have any way of getting it and end up making decisions that you know are very much to their detriment uh, because they're just not getting a, a basis for um, you know for good advice. No, th- that that's right. And w- one of the things that strikes me is is there are many places where the system has been fundamentally changed by doing things. So there's some very nice studies that look at things like um, people who have been given warrants to show up for a hearing, mm-hmm. and it turns out that the design of those forms actually have a big impact of whether or not people actually do show up. If you don't show up, of course, there is a bench warrant out. And if you're ever stopped, it's not just a ticket that you're going to be hauled off to jail. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's ways in which the system can be designed to minimize the need to have an expert for those people who don't have experts, Mm -hmm. particularly lawyers. Mm -hmm. Um, We've looked a lot, by the way, at choice architecture for different people, different kinds of people. Uh-huh. Um, and it turns out that and this is more recent. It's just it was being done at the time the book was finished. Um, it turns out people who are not less sophisticated tend to be more influenced by choice architecture. So go back to the health ex- insurance example. It's those people who don't understand health insurance who will be most influenced by the fact that you sorted them alphabetically as opposed to putting the lowest cost or the best option first. Mm-hmm. And so actually good choice architecture it doesn't remove the need for experts, but for the people who can't access experts, it actually gives them a cushion. It actually helps them to not make as bad of a choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that's very profound. So one of the things you mentioned toward the end of the book, um, which I found very interesting, was um, that you know that that choosers are are unaware. Right, of the impact of choice architecture on what eventually happens to them, right? Um, and I, I thought that was interesting. So if, if well, obviously read the book here. I'll do my Vanna White moment again, right? Elements <laughs> of choice, great Jenga thing on the front. Um, but aside from reading the book, like, are there are there things where we should just take a little pause and say, wait, wait a minute, before I before I make this decision? Like one of the things I've always 
been amused by is anytime you buy like a new device, right? A new computer or whatever, you take it out of the box. And Microsoft was famous for this and uh, Dell as well, right? It's like the first half hour of your engagement with this device used to be, you know, you'd have to sort through all the different preloaded stuff that came on the box. And many of us would just sort of went click, 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 done. And now that stuff is on your machine like forever. <laughs> and you never go through and take it off. <laughs> So uh, there, there, there are lots of examples of that. One of the ones that I, I find, I was shocked with how big it was, is the Apple um, deal with Google. It turns out that it, everyone uh, watching or listening might want to take a look at their phone and see what the default search engine is. And I can tell you, if you have an Apple phone, there's probably a 98% chance I could predict what search engine is. And that is, it's going to be Google. Why? Well, it turns out Google has signed a deal originally worth a couple billion, yes, with a B dollars. Some estimates now are, say, 12 or 14 billion. The latest I read was 22. 22 billion. I was looking at that just before this interview because I wow. was. I, that's, yeah. You know, you this is what happens that. when you write a book two years ago, uh, you know, where that text goes in two years ago. So 22 billion. Simply the default search engine. And last I looked, it was only three clicks to change the search engine. Mm -hmm. Now, that is pretty impressive. I mean, the dollar per click is probably not that much because there's so many clicks. But think about, you know, the market share, which it's very hard to get data, but, you know, it seems to be over 90% for Google people remain as Google users on their iPhone mm -hmm. because it's the default. Mm -hmm. Which is also super fascinating because, um, you know, Google has its own brand of phone, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and, and not to mention App, Apple would love to have a search engine probably as well. Probably, yeah. <laughs> they're, all, they're all in there competing with each other. Yeah. So um, I guess the second uh, big observation that you make is that um, designers really underestimate the, the, the consequences of their decisions. Um, and, and I know you know, just in life, a lot of these design decisions are, are made by people who are totally unaware, not qualified, not trained. They're not psychologists. They're not, you know, people that understand how human brains work. They're not neuroscientists. They're, you know, guys that design invoices. <laughs> I mean, I look at some of the invoices that, you know, you get on a regular basis from a company and it's like, how do I even know what to pay? <laughs> you know, even if I work my way through all the mechanics of how to do it, right? No, I think that's right. And I just want to go back. Your, your point was very, and I, I sort of should have talked about it a little more, is customers don't know about the influence. So let's set that up a little bit more. You're sitting there, you're being influenced by presumably Apple and Google to use Google as your search engine. But if I ask you, why did you use Google as your search engine? You go, I don't know. I don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if somebody is setting up a choice architecture they're half the time more of the time they're choosers the other people walk around saying i don't have a clue that i'm being influenced so therefore when it says here's your big chance you can influence somebody they actually say well i'm not influenced by it it doesn't matter and so it's not surprising when we make decisions the re thing that goes on is we're busy making the decision we're not saying oh gee why didn't they give me three options why did they put them in that order? We're not doing the analysis of that. And so it's something that, you know, I, the phrase choice architecture is only 12 years old. So it's not surprising that there's not much of a, of a set of people who do this. I mean, I think a lot of our MBAs hopefully are learning this mm -hmm. at, at Columbia and hopefully using it for the right thing. As mm -hmm. uh, Richard Taylor does whenever he signs his book, Nudge, he says, Nudge for Good. Uh, I love that. Oh, that's it great. Is. It is. Uh, it's lovely. Um, and so I think it's something I hope more people would, would sign when they actually are designing their choice uh, their choice environments, the choice architecture they're, they're giving people. Mm. Well, I really like that um, perspective. The other thing that it connects to is some work, well, certainly that I've been doing on innovation that Ben Fluberg from Oxford and a Danish university does on mega projects. And it all ties back to this, this sort of thinking fast and slow idea, mm -hmm. which is, um, and I think, 
I think it was Kahneman who makes this point that um, thinking slowly, like really turning over important and consequential decisions in our mind uses a lot of energy. And so our brains are kind of pre-programmed to think fast, you know, make the decision quickly yeah. to the next stage, glide path on to whatever the next thing is, get on with our day, order our food, <laughs> you know, whatever yeah. it is. Um, and so I think that's that's a fundamental thing about being human. So I guess one thing that occurs to me is like, when is it worth it? Like, when is it worth mm -hmm. saying, okay, I'm now going to step right back and really look at this decision architecture. So I, health, of course, it's worth it. Big legal problems, probably worth it. Um, financial decisions, definitely worth it. Um, but are there places where like you can really make a distinction between when does it matter and when does it not? There, there are friends I have who are big fans of what are called heuristics, simple rule of thumbs. And they'll do things that I think are classic mistakes. They'll say, well, I'm going to hire the first designer I meet who's not awful. And I have seen their houses. I think they're not doing a good job. So the, the point is that you can't always get away with these simple rules of thumb. I think the key is actually a little bit different. We're all putting this on the person making the decision. Mm -hmm. But the choice of architecture can create a lot of wisdom for people mm -hmm. and make it easier for them so they don't have to make they're very elaborate choice. So imagine you were just buying health insurance and someone asked you three questions and said, we don't know exactly what the right policy is for you, but we've ordered them from best to worst for you. Now, all of a sudden, you can make the choice much more easily. The expertise is not necessarily in my head, but it's built into the design. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like th to steal an example, actually, from Nudge, if a door handle looks like you should pull, it should be one that you pull, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't be a flat piece of metal that says push. <laughs> um, the ter term affordances, which comes from a psychologist, Don Norman, mm -hmm. says basically the environment can contain a lot of intelligence for us. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would think it's even more important in those places that really require system two thinking, require us to be engaged, that we get the choice of our architecture right. Mm -hmm. Because th for those people who can't, don't, or don't realize, you know, that they should be doing a more extensive job making a decision, mm -hmm. that's where you need to build, again, a way for people to, I guess I'll use the phrase, you know, fail gracefully, mm -hmm. that get the second best is not going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting, that's a great point. It's a very interesting area. And where I kind of have given it some thought, well, with the help of your book, I've, it's just got, got me really thinking, which is, you know, as we speed forward willy nilly into the world of digital activities, digital objects, the metaverse, wherever that's taking us, um, we're now going from a world where nature designed a lot of it to a world where human beings are designing a lot of it. And a concern that I have is that that's effort. I mean, that that requires skill, like to get people to be able to make choices in a world which is almost entirely constructed by humans, you know, with, with each of whom have goals, each of whom have objectives. Right. Um, I, I think this topic is going to be much more important um, and hopefully much more widely taught because you know, if you go outside and it's raining, you can make a choice to put up an umbrella. But if you go into the metaverse and something equally uncomfortable is about to happen to you, you don't necessarily know that. Let me give you a very simple example. You know, when I go shopping on my desktop, I have this nice 27 inch screen in front of me. Mm -hmm. But where do I go shopping now? I, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out his phone. Mm -hmm. Now I have something that's like a, a, an old you know, four by six file card. Mm -hmm. There's just going to be a lot more information. And the effective choice structure was large on the screen. It's huge on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I think as information and you know, attention is not getting more prevalent, it's getting scarcer because there are more demands. I think choice structure's impact just grows and grows. Yeah. It also makes me think of places where it's not so much the choice architecture as the outcome of our processes. And what I'm thinking here is, you know, the prevalence of scary negative headlines that often cause people to think things are worse than an objective analysis would suggest that they are. Or, you know, 
I was talking to a TV executive once who said, well, if I just measure audience attention and time, all I'd be featuring is car crashes. <laughs> you know, so, so it's also interesting it, it, when you think about how we get to what interests us. Um, and, and that's a choice as well. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I have a habit, actually. I, I'd be curious what you do when you decide what media to consume, what TV stations. Um, remember the bad old days, it's a place where it's gotten a little bit easier, where you had to get up and move a dial. Now you press buttons, which makes it a little bit easier to switch. You can talk to, to, it. talk to it, right? Notice how that's changing behavior, each of those. As, as, and they are choice architecture. Those are choice environments. <laughs> Um, it's really interesting, but I have habits. I, every morning, uh, my wife and I listen to the same three large scale, uh, public broadcasters, the BBC, uh, German, and then NPR. <laughs> and that's partly a way to insulate us perhaps badly, but we've made a, def a definite decision. That's the beginning of our media habit every day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that, you know, that might be better, it might be worse, but it's definitely a choice we made. And I think we make these choices about media the same way. And just as the old channel clicker mean and three networks, it was a very different world. And now saying, you know, show me the real housewives uh, on Alexa, you know, those are going to have a huge impact. And I think making it more consciously mm -hmm. might help, but make getting the choice architecture right also helps. Defaults on things like that are going to be very powerful. Yes. Order is going to be very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the book uh, is a real revelation. Again, uh, for those listening, the book is called The Elements of Choice. It's a delightful read, which is an unusual thing to say about a fairly well researched and academic book, but it's got tons of great examples, very relatable. Um, so, how do people learn more? Well, there is a website called the elements of choice.com. And you can always reach out to me at Columbia. I'd be glad to talk to you. And uh, Rita, I want to say it's been a delightful conversation. It's been tremendous. To get, I don't get to see you enough. So if, this, if it has to be this way, I'll take it. Well, maybe in the new buildings. So yes. uh, we'll plug for Columbia. We've got two gorgeous new buildings now that we're just sort of getting past the beginning stages of moving into. Uh, so thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, I hope you have a great time in Berlin. And I'll maybe see you back stateside. Yeah, th thank you so much and talk to you soon, I hope. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you all. Great. Bye.